Greetings and welcome back to room 303. We now come to the last poem of Gibran's The Prophet. This is lecture number 28 on death. And in some ways, this is so apropos that we would end this way. As I have said to you in earlier lectures, what motivated the entire project of our studying the prophet was the passing of one of our precious students recently. And in that moment of the passing, so many of us and so much of our school asking the simple theodicy question, why, why, what is the meaning behind this kind of passing? And now here we are at the very end. And we will, uh, in some ways, be ready then for the final farewell of Al Mustafa here in a few moments in, in the final, the very final passage. We started, notice, we started with love, we end with death. The integral view um, will uh, tell us that, you know, this is kind of going to be a heavy borrowing of uh, Leaves of Grass, Whitman's classic, Song of Myself, Passage 6. We will maybe have uh, some opportunity to end there, of course. Uh, our assumptions here, just to begin, are that you've been following our stuff at LearnStrong.net. Down that left-hand side is our playlist. I'm hopeful that you worked through our introductory set of comments, and I'm hopeful that you have now read and studied all of the previous poems we just finished with On Religion, and now here we are, uh, ready to finish. Now, in some ways, when we get to this passage on death, we're back to Plato's Phaedo, and the whole notion of Socrates getting ready to drink his hemlock shake and take his final odyssey. And of course, in the Phaedo, and we've given full lectures at LearnStrong.net if you want to run that to ground, in the Phaedo, Socrates is giddy about what he's about to take, this journey, and of course his students are all deeply, deeply sad, tragically sad. They can't believe that he's so giddy. And you know, he's like, what, guys, did you think I was going to live forever? I mean, we, you ain't met no 200-year-old people, which means what? Well, they were teaching it to us from the time we were quite young when we went to the park, and they said, it's time to go to the van. I don't want to go to the van. I want to keep swinging. No, no, honey, you can't. You don't, get to, you don't get to swing at the park forever. You have to go to the van. And from a very young age, they were teaching us, the van's always waiting, guys. You've not met any 200-year-old people. That is a powerful insight moment for us. Oh, you only get to swing at the park for a short period of time, therefore swing well, which will certainly be Gibran's argument in this passage as well. Um, now, of course, for Gibran, it won't shock us that he's going to look at death as, uh, from the perspective of freedom. Um, and think of it this way. If we are fundamentally energy, and we commented on this in our lectures on Plato's theory of the forms from Republic uh, 6 and then, of course, the cave allegory of 7, if we are fundamentally energy, and energy is that which can be neither created nor destroyed, then why do we fear death? Because death cannot be our destruction if we are energy. That insight will be central to this passage as well. And therefore, there should be no fear. Note the joy, in the tone of joy in this passage is remarkable, as well as the powerful word pictures, especially the famous word picture of the owl who in the daylight has to shut its eyes. What would happen if it could open its eyes? Um, notice all of the pairings that will happen in the prophet, right? Uh, lecture 12, buying and selling. Lecture 13, crime and punishment. Lecture uh, 16, um, reason and passion. We're going to be playing the same uh, as well. And you'll see as we finish, now first with death and then the farewell passage to finish, that Altmitra is going to the seers, the seers, who we started with at the very beginning of our collection of poems in the prophet, is going to take center stage. And in fact, we will finish with Almitra at the very end, the very last line of the prophet is in fact going to reference her. So in some ways, as we end, we're coming back to the beginning, which will make some sense, I think, for us. Then Almitra spoke saying, we would ask now of death. Notice it's not I, it's we. In other words, if you read the prophet well, the text, you move from an investigation of self to community, all of us. And there's that symbiosis, that going back to the previous lecture, that's always going to be central. And he said, you would know the secret of death. Again, we're back to epistemology, which is why we started our introductory lectures in our Big Five with knowledge, epistemology. And notice his use of the word secret and silent. And of course, that's been central all the way through. You would know the secret of death, but how shall you find it unless you seek it in the heart of life, the relationship between life and death, right? 
And then he goes to the owl metaphor. The owl, whose night-bound eyes are blind unto the day, cannot unveil the mystery of light. And of course, we immediately think of Plato's Republic, Book 7, and the allegory of the cave coming out into the light of the sun and all of that. If you would indeed behold the spirit of death, open your heart wide unto the body of life. Notice how he uses the word body here, but he says body of life. This idea of opening your heart, in other words, instead of being afraid of a question like death, right? We live in a culture where we put often those who are dying away in some kind of building so we don't have to see them. In the old days, of course, you died in the very bed that you were often born into, um, you know, as virtuous men pass mildly away and whisper to their souls to go, while some of their sad friends do say, the breath goes now, and some say, no, those opening lines of John Donne's valediction for bidding morning, we've commented on it at LearnStrong.net, you would be there and you would see, you would see the process of life and, and death in a far more visible way. And he says, open your heart wide into the body of life. For, he says, life and death are one, even as the river and the sea are one. And, I, and, and of course, it's a famous word picture, that river to the sea metaphor. Here, uh, it's, it's so poetically brilliant the way that it's played out. In other words, if you're going to investigate death, you must do it with a certain level of grace that leads you to freedom and away from fear. In the depth of your hopes and desires, lies your silent knowledge of the beyond. In other words, we already understand, he says, something about this question of death because the very breath that you're breathing right now had to have a beginning, and it has to have an end, guys. Think about that. And as, you were, as, as all of a sudden you grow really kind of quiet and still and mindful of the very breathing that is happening for you, we know about this idea that there is a beginning and then there must be an end. It's just that we have so much noise and distraction that we, we, we really don't pay attention to it. And then, of course, when we lose someone to death, we think, obviously, of our pal. Then all of a sudden, it becomes kind of powerfully obvious to us, oh, but we've known all along, he says it this way, in the depth of your hopes and desires lies your silent knowledge of the beyond. And like seeds, we're back to gardening again and, and planting, like seeds dreaming beneath the snow, your heart dreams of spring. I think, of course, of Shelley's Ode to the West Wind, If Winter Come, Can Spring Be Far Behind? I've given full lectures at LearnStrong.net. Trust the dreams, he says, for in them is hidden, back to secrets, hidden the gate to eternity. Your fear of death is but the trembling of the shepherd when he stands before the king whose hand is to be laid upon him in honor. Is the shepherd not joyful beneath his trembling? that he shall wear the mark of the king? Yet is he not more mindful of his trembling? It's a brilliant word picture. And of course it works well within the culture that Gibran grew up in where you'll have this shepherd who is being you, you know, thanked by the king, a person of great authority. And of course he is trembling with respect, with honor. And in some powerful way, this word picture works really well because he'll say it, we stand before death and we tremble, but we have always known it must be so. We've not met any 200-year-old people. Four, back to more rhetorical questions. What is it to die but to stand naked in the wind and to melt into the sun? And what is it to cease breathing but to free the breath from its restless tides that it may rise and expand and seek God unencumbered. In other words, freedom. Death is a freedom. Back to, again, Plato's Phaedo. Only when you drink from the river of silence shall you indeed sing. We're always back, again, to music. And when you've reached the mountaintop, then you shall begin to climb. It's a brilliant insight, right? I mean, he's commented on, you can't see the mountain when you're on the mountain. But think about the power of coming to the summit of Cloud Peak. Many of us, of course, have hiked it and love it. To the summit of Cloud Peak. It's only then that you begin to recognize, yes, no doubt, an accomplishment, but also the recognition that now real work begins. Think about those who climb Everest and make it to the summit. Well, okay, you made it. You know, golf clap to you, although obviously it's worth more than that. But then what? Well, yeah, you got to come down. And then what? Well, then you got to live the rest of your life with the recognition that you are worthy of that climb that you made. In other words, there's always something else to learn. And the way he says it is, when you've reached the mountaintop, 
then you shall begin to climb. And when the earth shall claim your limbs, then shall you truly dance. I love that the last word of the last poem before the farewell is the word dance, because in some ways, of course, that's what we've been doing the whole time, haven't we, in our study of Gibran's prophet. Well, at 2A, what are we going to say here? Well, obviously, death is a precious process, right, that qualifies life and qualifies love, and obviously, if understood well, leads us to freedom. When we recognize that you do not get to swing at the park forever, you got to go to the van, swinging becomes precious, and no matter how long we get to do it, for some of us, as we are referencing our pal who we lost, it only happens for a brief period of time. And yet, oh boy, to swing well, that's always the goal. To know that at any given moment, we may have to go to the van. That is also precious because that qualifies everything as valuable for us. And in the process of recognizing that with grace, there is the freedom. There is the joy. At 2B, I love the word pictures. The owl, the sea, the shepherd, the mountain, all of them work so well. Well, at 3A, where are we going to go? Well, I mentioned it, uh, Whitman's Song of Myself, Passage 6. Of course, Talks with Walt is our playlist at LearnStrong.net, where I've given lectures on every single poem of the deathbed edition of Whitman's Leaves of Grass. You'll maybe remember Song of Myself, Passage 6. I'm not going to exegete. You can follow that at LearnStrong.net. But how about this? A child said, what is the grass? fetching it to me with full hands. How could I answer the child? I do not know what it is any more than he. I guess it must be the flag of my disposition out of hopeful grease stuff woven. Or, I guess it's the handkerchief of the Lord, a scented gift and remembrance are designately dropped, bearing the owner's name some way in the corners that we may see and remark and say whose. Or, I guess the grass is itself a child, the produced babe of the vegetation. Or, I guess it's a uniform hieroglyphic and it means sprouting a light in broad zones and in narrow zones, growing among black folks as among white, Tuckahoe, Tuckahoe, Congressman Cuff. I give them the same, I receive them the same. And now, it seems to me, the beautiful uncut hair of graves. Tenderly will I use you, curling grass. It may be you transpire from the breasts of young men. It may be you are from old people or from offspring taken. It may be if I had known them, I would have loved them soon out of their mother's laps. And here, you are the mother's laps. This grass is very dark to be from the white heads of old mothers, darker than the colorless beards of old men, dark to come from under the faint red roofs of mouths. Oh, I perceive after all so many uttering tongues, and I perceive they do not come from the roofs of mouths for nothing. I wish I could translate the hints about the dead young men and women, and the hints about the old men and mothers and the offspring taken soon out of their laps. What do you think has become of the young and old men? And what do you think has become of the women and children? They are alive and well somewhere. The smallest sprout shows there is really no death. And if ever there was, it led forward life and does not wait at the end to arrest it and cease the moment life appeared. All goes onward and outward. Nothing collapses and to die is different from anyone supposed and luckier. Well, I think the power of that set of lines influenced Gibran's view of death. By the way, notice the picture, the brilliant picture that's a part of this section of the original publishing of The Prophet as well. I would certainly take you there. And then obviously, finally, at 3A, Plato's Phaedo has to come to mind as Socrates is ready to leave and go on his final journey. The new Odysseus, as Plato um, is maybe trying to create Socrates, as we've said in lectures at LearnStrong.net. Finally, at 3B, how, how are you going to own a passage like this? What are your thoughts about this passage? Does it give you comfort to read this set of lines? And how can you look at death from the perspective of grace, of freedom, of knowing that since you can't swing at the park forever, swing well, swing well. Well, let me congratulate you. You've done it. You've now made it through the last poem on death. But there's this question. How will Al-Mustafa leave at the end of the day? Well, that's the final words. That's the farewell, which is only, of course, the beginning. Thank you.